to moderate and conduct the meeting this evening. So thank you for all those who have uh, come out tonight. And we welcome everybody. Um, before we uh, actually begin the meeting, um, I'm going to turn the time over to our host, Emil uh, Kapu. To begin the previous proceedings on uh, on the right foot. So. Mahalo, Kim.
all of you who come through. Our evening with our speakers and the 
Yeah, the topic is Heonika uh, Aina, part of the Lolo Moriao, the land is chief. What's the rest of it? The land is chief and... Yeah, we are in Sorry.
Sorry, I'm just gonna put my water. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. And then, can I just, oh, is my seat up here? Okay. <laughs> I didn't realize I gotta sit over here. Okay. Put them high. Yeah, yeah, okay. I didn't know that was what this was for. Okay, I'll go on this one. Yeah, okay. One second, one second. Gotta get the logistics. Okay. Oh my goodness. First, Kukia Imauna. Aloha. Um, aloha, everybody. Um, I'm so honored to be here. Um, you guys are awesome. We watch you from the Mauna. We saw your amazing um, gathering march. Um, we feel your your prayers, and it really means a lot to us. Um, you know, just when we think, I I feel that um, I have no more space in my heart for Aloha. Akua just you know gives us these inspiring things that happen, and it feels like my heart's gonna break. You know. Um, so, I'm just really honored to be here. I'm honored to talk about this subject also, um, because it's, it's a huge subject. The key, the key part of the Olalunoya is not only that the land is the chief, but that we are the servant. Um, that's the most key thing. Um, when we look at the quote-unquote resource management. Uh, we're trying to change the languaging for that. Because we're not really looking at resources, we're looking at sources. Mauna Kea is the source of our water. Um, the ocean is the source of our life. Um, you know, and when we're talking about Mauna Kea and the, the the issues surrounding that is we're challenging the very notion that um, that telescope takes precedent over our sources. You know, the word resource inherently has an extractive nature to it. You know, when they say resource, it means, oh, I can then extract the resource, use the resource like this. You can use it, but you have to use it in such a way that, not that we conserve it, but the Kanaka way is that it is restored to its abundance. So it, it's Aina Mamona, right? Um, I learned this, this word from Malia Kuragawa, you know, and it's a powerful word, but that is really our resource management model. Uh, is, is to restore the aina back to the abundance, uh, make it better than it was before we arrived, you, you know what I mean? And, and, and so that's a whole nother way of seeing um, the conservation model. And by the way, I want to challenge conservation because we don't want to conserve Hawaii we want to restore Aina Momona to Hawaii, restore abundance to the oceans, restore um, clean water back to our Aina, restore the Aina back to its original state the day it was created. You know, Hawaii is the endangered species capital of the world. And why is that? How could that be? We have more species who are rare, threatened, and or endangered than anywhere else, given our size and our number of species. How can that be? You know, um, every life form on Mauna Kea is rare, threatened, and or endangered. 
how can that be? It's because we are denied our right to not only access Mauna Kea, but to implement our own Aina Momona strategies. You know, when, when, when they deny our right to worship, our right to go up Mauna Kea, they are taking away our ability to restore the Aina back to its Aina Momona state. Because when you lay your ho'okupu on the lele or the ahu, you are laying it there, not only in ceremony, but also to bring all of the kinolao back to where they belong. So when we, when we make those ceremonies uh, for the polohivas, the solstice and equinox ceremonies, we, we gather all of the kinolao and we go from the ocean all the way up and it takes us all night. When we arrive at the summit, we walk out to the lele, well, where there used to be a lele before the university took it down. There is an ahu still um, to lay the whole kupu on behalf of not only our ohana, but our moku, but our kopai aina, but for the whole honua and for all people. In that prayer, we are asking for the restoration of our aina. And so when you, when you, when you think of you know, resource management, you think first, you put the resource source in the middle and what is good for the source is good for everyone. If it's good for the land, it's good for us. So in our ceremonies, we are asking the Akua to abide here now and to restore the Aina back to, oh sorry, Kalamai, back to its original state, the state it was when it was created. That's the, the pulling. Because when the Akua abide, that which is contrary cannot exist simultaneously. So you cannot be in a state of love and a state of war at the same time. You know, you know what I'm saying? So we are calling forth that. And in that, the Akua abide. And when they are there, when they traverse the land, they restore the land as the day it was created. So in, in that journey, we go from one pole, the deepest, darkest ocean, to the other pole, the highest pole in the highest heavens, the deep purple space, the Luna Lilo. So we go from the deepest ocean to the highest pole. Both are pole, right? Uh, another pole, and what is pole? It is the, the infinite potential of all things yet to be created. So the pole is the realm of creation. That's why you hear people speak of Mauna Kea as our origin place, our creation place, because that's where all creation unfolds. And, and um, in the practice, we must acknowledge the lake, Wayao, because that's where the two poles meet in this up and down. They meet right there in the swirling of those waters. The, the ocean and the fresh water connect. There's no bottom, the, the, scientists, the scientists can't find the bottom of the lake. Um, of course not, because that's the point where the poles are connected. Um, and so that's, that, that's, that's why people bring their baby pico where some ohanas actually reintroduce their ohana, their things like this. My ohana has that practice also. So, um, 
So there's another, there's another pole, because there's the vertical pole, but there's also the horizontal one. And that one goes across Kopai Aina, but where it really enters into that sacred space is in, out in Papahana Mokoakea. The, the so-called National Marine Monument, um, basically it's the sacred space going this way. So those, those are places where creation still continues. Um, and, and we need to reconnect ourselves and our mind, put back our mind from that deconstruction of the colonization and decolonize our mind to remember our way of resource management. Because, um, you know, we've had the University of Stanford in California has written extensively about how to restore our oceans. And they say, if you want to restore our oceans, you need to follow the Native Hawaiian traditional models of conservation. Um, you know, the, if you look at the way the water flows, it flows also from Mauka to Makai. The water above belongs to the fish below. The mulibai is necessary to create and make our fish ponds thrive. But one of the reasons why we have trouble making the Aina Momona or restoring Aina Momona is because there's water theft everywhere. The extraction of water, if the couple system was in place as it should be, and I'm going to argue that we need to restore it. The state cannot restore it. Only we can restore it, and the state can help us enforce it. You know, because it is a cultural and religious practice, the couple system. And so we must restore it. And that would involve no water theft. Because if you imagine, not long ago, we had this, about the same number of people that we have today before, okay? But everyone ate, everyone was fed, and everyone had a place to live, right? And look now, right? Um, that's what we need to continue to stand for. and to not stand for any less, because we, didn't, we have a right not to participate in our own demise. You know, and, and what we're really saying on the Mauna, the message on the Mauna is that this is where we must say no to this development. Because in saying yes to it, it means destroying our water you know, destroying our species that are found nowhere else on earth. You know, when we were in the Contessa case hearing, we learned that science had discovered a new little lichen. And everyone went, whoa, okay, what's, what does a lichen do? It's very important. I mean, also up there where there's no water, the lichen pull the water from the, from the mist, right? Just as the trees, you know, pull the water from the clouds in that realm. Pu'uhuluhulu area is the realm of the rainbow goddesses who traverse across the Kopai Aina via that level, that level, right? They're not limited, you know, so they can traverse all the way across. That's one of the things that we kept saying when they were, when we were discussing Haleakala and the connection between Haleakala and Mauna Kea is that it is connected via the level, the level of the heavens where the, the, the mist and the clouds dwell, but also where the goddesses dwell of the mist. And so here's this little lichen. And the scientists said it was new to science. And so they discovered it out in the, the area where the proposed development is. And they said, um, we asked them, do you have a name for this lichen? And they said, no. 
they don't even have a name for it. And we said, but you're willing to destroy it, yet you don't have a name, nor do you have a, an understanding of what its purpose in the world is, what it does. Um, and they said, yeah. And we said, well, if you destroyed it, how long would it take to recover? He said, oh, probably 50 years. But they don't even know if there's any more of them like that. So how can we, what kind of logic thinks it's okay to destroy something you know nothing about and may not ever allow that thing to recover? That kind of logic is no logic at all and it needs to be rejected across the board, you know? But the only way we can restore the Aina, back to the Aina Momona, is if we take an affirmative stance as a, as a people for Papa, Papa Hanamo, Earth Mother. And what we keep saying is we want to conspire with Earth Mother for life because the default of all of creation is to continue to create, to continue to live. And, and, and our think, it's our thinking that goes into these diminished extractive thought forms that are the imper scientific imperialism, big words, but you know what I mean, right? Scientific colonialism. The, the, the idea of that science is, is superior to indigenous science, indigenous wisdom. And this is aole. It is not true. And it's just, it's not true on so many levels. But we're having to train the world to look differently. And that's what this, this stand is about too. It's changing the paradigm. It's saying we're not going to be on the train that's going to go off the track. We're going to jump. We're not going to join you over there. We're trying to actually get them to join us. When we went to see Gordon Moore, who is the single greatest single funder, he's donated more money to the TMT than some of the countries have given. We went to see him and asked for an audience with him, but he didn't meet with us. But his, the president of his foundation did meet with us. And in that meeting, we said to him, you know, it's not about science versus culture. It never has been. And by the way, that was your PR people who created that narrative, which is a false narrative. But we're here to hold out our hand to you to ask you to join us. We have a thriving society that lasted for thousands of years. We have resource management models, source management models that could help you too. Looking into space is a noble endeavor but it isn't necessary at this time. What's necessary at this time is that no matter if you're coming from native science or modern science, both agree the earth is in crisis. So we want to reach out to you to say, join with us for a better world. You have an opportunity here to tell Mr. Moore and Mrs. Moore that we want to join with you to help you see what we see too. Because Mr. Moore is an important person in this, on this planet. He invented the Intel Pentium processor. Well, he's a co-inventor. But that's in everyone's computer. We want you to be on our side. We want you to help us help the Earth. That's what we said. Of course, he hasn't come back and responded. Um, unfortunately, but we're not giving up. We're not going to give up. Um, we have no reason to give up. We have every reason to be hopeful 
um, because it's time. You know, everyone asks, you know, what's the takeaway, Kealoha, what's, you know, there's no takeaway. It is just that Kapu Aloha is our, uh, our stand, nonviolent stand, for a better world. Uh, it's our stand, and it's the only stand that, that allows compassion to enter a world, to challenge the corporate uh, culture. Not all corporate culture is bad, but there's a lot that is. And it's insane, and it should be rejected. But Kapu Aloha is our way of, of offering to the world an alternative to live differently, to um, feel strong to live differently. Um, we have had a thriving culture, and we need to just restore that back. And, you know, lots of people go, oh, you want us to go back? I said, no, I don't want to go back. I want to go forward in time into the better world that we collectively can create through Kapu Aloha and the nonviolent stand for peace and compassion on earth. That's the only thing that can challenge the insanity of the culture of corporate culture that, that has gone astray. You know, I mean, at a certain point, the question is going to be, Mr. Moore, how many Hawaiian people are you willing to hurt, maim, and or kill? For, okay, for, for your project. That, I mean, you know, that, that's the reality. That when they send forces forward to us, that's to hurt us. And, you know, everybody is talking around that, but that's the truth of it. So Mr. Moore, Mrs. Moore, University of California TMT board members, how many Hawaiians are you willing to hurt, maim, or kill for your project? That's the question on the table. And our question is, we reach out to you and hold our hand out to you to join with us to do something better for a better world, for our keiki and our mo'o puna, and for theirs too. So um, I will end there and say we have everything to have hope for. Um, and to keep standing and moving towards a better world. Um, and, and I thank you all for all of your aloha and prayers for the Mauna uh, and, and for that better world. And I'm just very thankful to be here. Mahalo, aloha.
small town called Punaka'a. And whenever I drove by Punaka'a, the thing I always remember is how green it was. I hope it's still green and not brown like he had. It's still green. <laughs> something is still green. <laughs> so uh, I know Joshua or Lankila was educated and not at the Mokaha schools. I think you went to elementary and intermediate school. And then in your high school, you were actually transferred over to the uh, first Hawaiian Immersion School at Hawaiian right? Where he graduated, <clears throat> I believe it was 2004. And then 2005, he became a teacher, a Hawaiian studies teacher. Been that ever since, and that's, so that's when I first met him back in uh, 2014 when Hawaii study teachers gathered uh, from across the islands to meet at the, what was formerly called the Prince Hotel, and it was part of the uh, AHA Kupuna. Kupuna. It was organized by many people, including my friend Bonnie Herbert, who was a Hawaiian studies teacher coming to the elementary school. So they came to learn about our island, in particular the Moku of Hula. So they spent a couple of days listening to people from that area and learning about Hula. So, and then uh, Mauna Kea is a Kiahi. Uh, he's an amazing young man. I was so impressed when I met him for the first time because because he could hold that little, he knew the protocol as a chance. And to me, he's continued to educate himself in, in so many areas of life, including culture practices pertaining to conservation. So I can't wait to hear what you have to share with us tonight. So let's all give a warm welcome. Thank you. It's an honor to be back here. Um, uh, I was reminiscing my first time truly coming to this land. I had come on a family vacation a long time ago. We were staying over in Lahaina. But then I came back actually, so 2014, we had AHA here years before. 2011 was over here was AHA too. 2008 was Hana. So I think a special connection here, Mama, too. Uh, my, my kupuna, uh, Julia Kalaiwa'a, uh, is also from Maui. Um, so I've been trying to find that. I don't know, you know anyone know Kalaiwa'a? Yeah? Oh, hey, I'm going to find him. Um, but it's, it's an honor to be able to be here again um, after being really, int truly introduced to this place um, by the Ohana here. Um, and recognizing uh, for me, especially uh, Kiha Wahine, uh, is very important um, in the Mo'olelos of, of um, not of my Ohana, but of my upbringing uh, through Mo'olelo. So, um, as Uncle shared, um, I'm a product of all of our Kupuna and Makua who fought back when told you cannot be, you cannot have, you cannot do these things anymore. For all those kuē aloha aina kanaks kanaks back then, I'm a product of you, and mahalo mahalo yago ko for fighting. Um, so I uh, born and raised Honokaa. Um, I spent a lot of my time actually grew up in Waipio Valley, 
Um, that's kind of like, that was our stomping ground, that was my turf. Um, you know, it was down surfing or it was working in somebody's patch. Um, back then, to most time, my, one of my first kumu was with Uncle Kia Fronda uh, from my POA in the back of the um, wheel. And I'm actually one of those original little brats who used to run around um, in the Kukuluku Mohana. Kukuluku Mohana was a summer program that was started um, by Ines Fun and Tiku just put out a post the other day. Tiku Kakala just put up a post with an old picture. And they were saying, when we was young Kanakas who wanted to do something, and her, Uncle Nale, was skinny and <laughs> was young, and um, the beard was like this short. Um, Uncle Kia, and Tiana, and Uncle Kili, and all these Makua, who I'm realizing I'm now at that age that they were out of that picture. Right. So, um, but when they had this, this dream of creating this space and this time for young, for young Hawaiians to be Hawaiians, um, and began with these summer programs in White People Valley, um, full cultural immersion. Um, I remember my first year, I think I was like in fourth or fifth grade. Yeah, they drop you off in the valley for like a month. <laughs> you know work, you know eat. Yeah, I loved it. Um, uh, my upbringing was kind of tough. Honaka, if you know Honaka, we kind of a rough space. Yeah. Um, my father is uh, Stephen Manuel. He's actually our Hana comes from Kona. My mama is Maureen McGraw. She's from Colorado, Irish, Scottish, Uh Love my mama. She's been uh, the backbone of our Hana for sure. Um, but I remember her telling me, I cannot teach you how to be Kanaka and you have Hawaiian boys, so get over there. Um, I cannot teach you these things, so she made sure to drop us off if we could. But she loved that part. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so I was very blessed to be able to have that opportunity of I could still say old school teaching, yeah, that old school, um, and you know that's actually these these um, these programs. Kukuluku Mohana was actually what seeded the the vision of that that later on became the Hawaiian Charter School movement. Yeah. Um, these programs, um, I remember I remember at Tikuka Hakala was speaking that. Um, you know, they observed, all of us, especially young Hawaiian kids, you know, we were all the ADHD, learning deficit, all the derelict kids, right? Every brand that the Hawaiian only could slap on top of us, that's what we were. But yet, you take us down into the valley and into this Hawaiian area, and we were memorizing pages of chants. We were still working the aina. We were doing all these things. It's our learning abilities just were amazing. Hands on, yeah? A lot of hana mekalima. Um, so I remember I took Ku, uh, and I quote her, uh, she remember her saying, why, why would we then observe where our children, in a, a, a learning um, environment where our children thrive, why then would we want to put them back into the belly of the beast? And that was the vision that launched the effort for the charter schools. Actually prior to charter schools, the very first uh, component of this was a Hawaiian academy, which was a school within a school at Honaka'a High School um, in my backyard. Honaka'a is actually used for a launching pad for a lot of things. A lot of things that have become quite, you know, big things today began in our small community. But, you know, we rule, right? So they got to go chase money in order to survive. Yeah? The voyaging, the whole hokulea, the whole vision was inspired by the, the, the illustrations of Uncle um, Herbkane. Where was he inspired to draw those things? In White People Valley. Yeah. Yeah, the very first student sailing programs with Makali'i from Honaka'a High School. Why? Because Uncle Clay was all Honaka'a. Yeah. The Hawaiian Charter School Movement, Hawaiian Academy, rooted in Honaka'a. Then became charter in the year 2000, moved to Waimea. They plenty of money over there. Yeah. Um, so I remember uh, when Kano Kain opened in 2000, I was actually coming into my ninth grade year. Um, so all of my high school years was in this charter school. Um, and I remember telling my friends, I'm going to come back senior year, graduate with you guys. It didn't happen. But I made a promise that I would come back to my home. And if anything, that's something that Kano instilled with me. You can grow up, you can go do your things, but make sure you've got to come back and take care of the place that raised you. 
So I made an effort after I graduated. I took a, hit, uh, a chance at college. I hated it. I literally lasted one semester. And I left and became a teacher. <laughs> uh, so I've been teaching for almost 15 years now. Um, from preschool to 12th grade. Um, Ike Hawaii is predominantly that. I, taught, I went back to Honaka'a school and I taught back in my... You know where it is to teach alongside your old elementary school teacher? <laughs> <laughs> but beautiful that. So I took that big koleana, the idea of trying to... With the mission to try and reverse the flow. So much would come out of Hamakua and go and end up going other places to sustain. So this mission of trying to bring these things, this Ike back. Because Honaka'a too, our area, we get choke Hawaiians. But those programs were not able to be sustained there. So it's a mission to try and do that. Okay, I'm getting to the mountain. Yeah. So but now, you know, going to Kano, uh, Kano Kaina now, you know, growing up, I always knew Mount Akea. Yeah. I'm on the slope of the mountain. Certain points in Honaka, you see the pools. Um, so I, that was always my mauna. And my dad, sometimes I remember working in Paka Ranch, we'd go up um, up upper Ahu Aloha, and that's all you see is the mauna. Um, going to Kano Kaina and Waimea, now I see the mauna every day. And here in the Mo'olelo, that's really what began to, um, you know, as long as I was born or been alive, there's been telescopes on the mountain. Yeah? And when the last telescope was built in the late 90s, I was not in the age of consciousness yet about paying attention to it. Yeah, it was just well, not a white thing that went up there. Yeah? Um, but even starting to learn just the Mo'olelo of, of the mountain, I began to question myself of, well, why is those up there? This is a sacred place. That's where the goddesses live. Why are they up there? That's a fragile ecosystem. Why are those up there? I remember already, just by learning about the mountain, I could already devise my own questioning of what was happening up there. Yes, when I was younger, we went up and go play snow and everything, but I remember as you know, more um, I learned, I tended to go up there and play a little softer. No, 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 go on the pool, just go slide down by the road. You know, just pack, only pack the snow that's on top, that's by the road. No, I'm over there, pack the snow. It was just a little bit more like, okay, okay, we, we gotta be a little more sensitive up here. And when I was a young kid. So, um, then becoming a teacher in my hometown, of course, you know, as anybody else would tell, like in Hilo side, tell the stories of Pele, for Hamakua, these Mo'olelos is white, is Mount Kea. Poliyahu, Lilinoi, Wayau, Kaupokahani, all these Akua of the Mauna, Nabahine no Mauna. Um, so I began to build my own Pilina. Um, I think it was maybe about 2011. Wait, what year is this? Yeah, about 2011, I think it's the first time I, like TMT, um, caught on my radar. Um, and that's because uh, I, uh, I danced for Antipua Case. Uh, she's our, uh, was one of my, she was my first kumuhula. And, um, and then oh, I had danced her for when I was younger and then I, she was getting involved and speaking of these things and then eventually the Case family became um, uh, legally uh, involved. And so we were coming and supporting her and it was kind of like, yeah, yeah, because I don't like those things up there either. Um, and just being driven to, to learn more, to stand and support. Um, I remember my first act of Protest <laughs> was kind of like, whoa, we're doing that like the people on the movies. Huh? Um, was it at the county building? We had the rally, yeah. Uh, I think they were uh, issuing the permits or something. And it was big. That was like two, three hundred of us. Yeah. Um, schools came out and everything too. And I, was, I remember this in that, the Bahu Sound was in there. I like it in this one. <laughs> um, and you know, eventually just kind of tracking and following and trying to support all the way through and just watching and then becoming more intrigued, not to just be an outside, but oh, shucks, we lost, or oh, what's going on? But actually like, you know, quit asking the questions, go, go figure it out, go learn. So learning to research and, and follow and read, <laughs> had to read <laughs> or watch the whole video. <laughs> um, but just to educate, so to become more informed um, of what was happening. And so starting to learn even more about the history of the mountain. Whoa! And hearing, hearing all those who have been involved in this for so long, hearing everything that they've experienced and, um, from dealing with the previous telescopes and just seeing the corruptive shifts and change and just like, this is BS! 
Um, and then came, comes to 2014. 2014, it's gotten all the way to the point. The machines, they've got their permits. It's all good. They're going to be starting construction within the year. They're going to attempt their groundbreaking. Mm -hmm. And I remember at the, the call was to gather at Hulu Hulu. They were going to, they were going to hold a ceremony. And I remember we're, me and some of my friends were preparing down in Hilo and the call came out that we're going to stand and we're going to be pa'a in our pule, kapu aloha, and they will see us when they drive past. Some of us were like, I don't know if I can do that. <laughs> I don't know if I can just let them drive up that road. <laughs> um, so I remember that drive about 4 o'clock in the morning with our tea, hot tea, oh Pandora. <laughs> what are we gonna do? I don't know, I don't know what you can do. I don't know. The biggest plan that we had was, wow, we gotta check it by the camera so you can see our signs. That's the extent of a plan that we had. We like check it in our, our signs in the back of the camera. We never take anything beyond that. Um, and then we arrived there uh, at Pulu Hulu Hulu, and some of us, we said, okay, we're going to go ahead and we're going to join with the first ceremony because they were going to do a ceremony every hour on the hour. And I had shared, just to kind of share, a lot of this is what has made this movement possible sometimes is having to step out of our norm. And sometimes even step up, uh, uh, be kind of, have to step out of our comforts of what we believe in sometimes. And sometimes that's even our respect to our kumus and our kupuna. Because I tell you this, none of this would be happening today if I listened to the kupuna. Who told us, no, you're not going up there. We're staying down here. And make sure you know it wasn't me told you that. No, it wasn't you. <laughs> and I was like, you know what? <laughs> At this point, it's a future I'm going to live, I'm going to have to make this decision. And I said, my car is leaving in five minutes. So I was like, okay, okay, I'm ready. I was like, I cannot sit here, love you, but maha gotta go. <laughs> and so we drove up. Uh, we ended up getting to the visitor center. And we went and did our protocol at the, at the second ahu and we came back out and oh my god, then the caravan started coming. Of all of these astronomers and all of these big whips and all these guys driving. And I never know if they were like, can I? I, I went step in the road. No! <laughs> and they would stop and then my auntie was up there, she was crying and everything and just slowly the, the popo, it was nice, they kind of just kind of not just this way, and then one went down, and went, oh, we step back in front. So we kind of gave him hard rub the first round, but it was kind of like, rah, 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 a little bit of that. And then they got, they went past, and um, we were like, rah, we gotta get ahead of them, we gotta catch up with them, we gotta, and we started to shoot up the mountain again, and we saw that they had pulled over, so like, oh, okay, we're in front of them, okay, no man. And as we're going up the mountain, something would tell me, hey, if anything, Kupuna, that you better listen to is, they said, come on, Allah. So we pulled our whole caravan over and we got out and we said, okay, wait, wait, wait. Okay, what just happened down there? We, we cannot bring that up any higher. Let's reset ourselves. We cannot be like that again. And so we just kind of pulled it, we calmed down, and then we drove on. Yeah? Um, from there, the rest is on YouTube. From there you get up to the top, we were stopped over there, we were stopped. I know they say we blocked the road, no, right. we were blocked. Yes. The police had the road stopped, so we were just stuck in line. <laughs> they all came up behind us, we was all wanted to go, but they even stopped us, yeah? <laughs> and then, um, okay, then you guys saw the other part, yeah? Um, <laughs> well, actually, no, there's one more fancy part that actually the people don't see. If you watch that, that drum breaking ceremony, that I, say, I, I allude to it a little bit, but when we actually began to walk up to go over to the groundbreaking site, I was actually struck by a car. Uh, one of the rangers actually tried to cut us off. And there was a young woman with her daughter. So he was flying up the road, so I stood in the road. 
So like the slow down dude, he never slowed down. He came up full blast and braked right in front of me to the point that I saw the head we blashed on that. And before I could take another step, he gassed it again. Cleaned out my legs, but I ended up on the hood of the car. And as he kept going, that's when I first met Kohokahi. Kohokahi jumped on the hood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I never know who he was, but Donovan jumped on the hood with me. And I was like, I'm stuck on his car because the guy's still going. And he went about another 20 yards until some of the other guys above laid down in the road. Then I was able to get off in the car. And then that's what gave me all that energy for run the rest. Yeah. <laughs> Barefoot. He was barefoot. I don't remember anything. <laughs> but um, but why? What is it really that gave all this energy for this little brat from Honokawa to go that far? Okay. Um, I'm an elementary school teacher. It's not like I practice this. Um, no. Ao. Allowing the kupuna to jump in and take the wheel. So, for me, it was also as important why even following up after that to continue to engage um, at this level is because for me, I could not go back to teaching my children and look into their faces and continue to tell them these ancient stories about the significance and the sacredness of this mountain and be sitting in that room when the machines are ripping at it up above. What truth is there to anything that I was sharing to these kids then? What truth is there to any of these stories that our kupuna passed on to us if I'm willing to sit on the side and allow it to be destroyed? I could not do that to my kumu. I could not do that to my kupuna. And I sure as hell would not allow do that to my children. I had to make sure that all this energy I was putting into this small level that was guiding the lives of my children, that I'm going to stand behind it, you know, and I'm going to live by it. So it's, it's, there's so much to learn. So for me, when the, this is how I share, because you know, after that, of course, for the next couple of years, every principal was like, okay, we cannot talk about the issue, yeah, because da da da. It's like, no worry, I'm not going to talk about the issue. I'm just going to tell the story of the Mauna. Because I remember how when I was younger, when I just hearing the stories, I began to draw my own questions, learning about the mountain. Because right now, if you go up to the education center on Mauna Kea, there's like this much information about Mauna Kea, and the rest is all about astronomy and telescopes. So how much do you get to actually learn about the mountain? Yeah. So for me, that was my favorite Ololo no Heiau growing up. So, and then to the process of Makavalu, you know, as we dissected and looked deeper into the Kauna behind a lot of this, what is an Ali'i? What makes an Ali'i an Ali'i? You couldn't campaign to become an Ali'i. There was no voting process to be Ali'i. Yeah was through your moku as uh, I think it's Malo writes, yeah? everybody at one point, or is it Kamakao, I forget, but um, everybody was Ali, but if you forgot your moku Auhau, then you become a Kainana. Because uh, the Ali has a direct lineage to the Ahua, therefore that was the Kuleana of the Ali. Yeah? When something is wrong, it's up to them to tap through that family line, to bring, to tap into the Ahua, to bring whatever is needed. Um, so, because that's what the Aina does. The Aina provides whatever is needed. So here in all Aina. Yeah. Um, and it is an honor to serve. It is honor, it's always an honor to serve such a noble leader as the Aina. One that is always feeding, always giving. Yeah. So, um, with that, I'm going to wrap up, I'm going to wrap up this talk. Uh, yeah. I also look at, for me, you, when you make up a little idea, what is Akua? What is an Akua? Okay, because nowadays we use plenty, we use that word, but the image is not correct necessarily. Yeah? Um, when we talk about Kiakua, you know, 
That's one culture's interpretation of an of an akua. But it's not the Hawaiian. That's not how our kupuna saw an akua. What is an akua? Look at the word. Akua. Being of the back. That which is at your back, your kua, your spine, your no, like your ivi kua mo, your vertebra. Every vertebra represents an ancestor. Another generation prior than it is because of that accumulated, that kuku of, of knowledge and wisdom and sacrifice and giving that you are able to be upright alive today. So that which is it, the back, that which sustains, that's an akua. So for us, there's, I always say, uh, for Hawaii, when you really look into it, there's no question of the existence of Hawaiian akua. Why? Because they're right in front of you. We're engaging with them all the time. Don't ever forget that before we, when we speak of the akua like, like Pele, before we talk about the vahine, or the woman that we want to see in the smoke, yeah? Oh, look there, I see Pele. If you're looking at the volcano, you're looking at Pele. Period. It's not so much just the humanoid figure that is the God. The element is the God. Because what is a God in Hawaiian thinking? It's that which supports your life. That fire erupting as a build is that. That's the Akua. Okay? It's not so much the idea of Kane is the God of water. It's Kane is water. That's your God. That is the Akua. So the separation of the element and then this spiritual entity that's something that was brought to us this we gotta pop them back together yeah? they are one and the same yeah so like when we look at mauna awakia now we're talking about when we speak of their physical manifestation their kino lao yeah uh mauna awakia the primary akua that the, the top four that, that know on this mauna they are the daughters of kane the god of life was the primary element that sustains all life? Huh? Oh, greater than vital. Like the primary kinola or physical manifestation of Khan is the sun. For it's the sun that governs whatever shape the vai is going to be ice, liquid, vapor. It is the sun that will hook you and make the vai from the kai. And then creates the most massive desatellization process ever. With the most intricately amazing transportation system ever. Because of the influence of the heat from the sun. Gives us our wind patterns. Yeah? That moves the clouds and the da 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 da. Precipitation da 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 da. That is where the next element of Kani is the vai. The daughters of, of Kane born to the mountain. Kaupo Kane. The thunderstorms and the subterranean waterways. Lilinoi. The mist, the fogs, the Uhiwai. Yeah. Wayao. The lake. High in the summit. And the most divine one that will carry the highest couple. Poliyahu. The snow itself. Then they're given attendants. Li Hao. The frost. Ki Pu The hail. Kuauli. The blizzards. What they all have in common? They're all white. They're all water. So to understand the stories and the images of the Akua of the mountain is to understand the hydrological cycles of Mauna Awakia. That is Hawaiian science. Right there. So even in our culture, there is no separation of science and spirituality. Our spirituality is scientific observation of a collective over thousands of years.
questions of our, our speakers this evening. And we have another, are we going to use this mic for them to speak into, or we have a funny mic? We use this one. So, uh, if anyone has a question, we'd like to invite you to speak into the mic because this is being recorded. And the sound is much better when you record it if you speak into the mic rather than speak where you're seated. So who has a question? Anybody have a question? Sometimes people have to think. Our face gives us our individuality. 
So when I say aloha, I'm identifying and I'm connecting with each individual sovereign spirit in front of me. Your alo. Alohi alo, face to face. Ha is what? The breath of life. What is breath? Breath is an exchange. Breath is always an exchange. Every time we hanu iloko, we are breathing in what the natural world is breathing out. And we contribute to that by when we hanu iwaho, we breathe out what they breathe in. Who are those main elements that we are exchanging with? Kumula is one, but actually, what is actually responsible for over 70% of our planet's oxygen? Coral reefs and plankton. More of our, most of our planet's oxygen is produced by those little microscopic organisms. The Ukukuako, the very first created in our cosmology. The foundational creature of existence is still responsible for all of our existence for maintaining that today. Yeah. It wasn't until after the Koe Inuhe, the worm, exited from the sea and Elihopuhonua dug and mounded up the earth and made the earth plentiful for them, the trees to grow, and they added to the oxygenness of the planet. So what is aloha? It is about exchange, but recognizing something in its individualness, its sovereignness, its uniqueness, and understanding what your exchange is with it. So I say aloha, I recognize you as a sovereign person, and we're sharing time and space together right now. So for me, my hypothesis is this is where now the English term comes in because if we have to share time and space together, then what's the healthiest way to do that? Love. In a loving manner. That's the healthiest element. That's for me the essence of this aloha. So for me, we say aloha. So I say aloha aina. It is that. Do you aloha your aina? Do you actually understand the uniqueness of each ecosystem? The uniqueness of each plant, each animal, each mountain range, each she, uh, she short, she shall, she shall, she short. <laughs> each spring, every element down to, oh, 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 I was thinking about this one. And he was talking about the lichen colonies up on the mountain. I found, you know what the Hawaiian word is for lichen? Akua. So, um, yeah, I'm a kind of a sharing here. Tells you something, yeah? So when we say aloha aina, do you, uh, do you know your home? Do you know your backyard and how it works? Do you know how, um, uh, Mauna Kawahine, plays a role into the water systems of this area. Do you know what kumulaau grows in that area and then coming down from the different vow and what animals and plants there and how they play a role into your existence, into sustaining your life. And when you understand that, then you will understand your place in being part of that. So I say aloha aina. Yes, I know there's the history of the political party, and da, 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 da. but that all is only fit because of this unique relationship that our kupuna had with Aina. Because yeah? remember, the essence of this is like kumulipo action. It's not a resource, it's a kupuna. Those trees are kupuna, the animals are kupuna, the water is kupuna, the mountain are kupuna. They are all standing springs that illuminate life. Therefore, we have to make sure to malama that and that we become part of it. So when I say aloha aina, uh, I stand because I understand my relationship and how this aina works. So my stance as an aloha aina is to try and make sure that these things keep happening. Because what, in essence, they're akua. They are the staffs of life that have been here for thousands of years, that sustained thousands of generations of our people, and we need them to still be here so they can continue to generate life to feed thousands of future generations. That's what mountains do. Mauna, mauna. Continual movement forward. Mau. Aloha aina. How do we preserve that? Kapu'amoha is great. Holding yourself accountable in the sacred mandate 
to look at each individual and analyze your relationship and how you're going to engage. Oh, it took me a long time to come up with all those words. Oh, yeah. fighting but in a different way right now we are living in a historic moment this is the largest mobilization activation of the native hawaiian people in our entire history um, and a big reason for that is because we're coming at it differently um, it has been a kind of a challenge because a lot of us were i'm a i'm a independent person all the way but I've also been able to have to sit back and observe generations before me go round and round and round in arguments and fights about it. Yeah? We have like five different kingdoms now. Which one you like? Yeah? And everyone's arguing on who's bigger and better and that, 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 that we get more historical clout or whatever. And become so ugly in the hakaka, I wouldn't want to be part of any of them. Because it's not, it's not, it's, for me, personally, I actually stayed out of a lot of that, that talk because I was like, it doesn't sound like a nation I would want to be part of, and how it was coming out all the time. For me, the, 
we look again at what is governance. It starts with people. It starts with ohana. It starts with community. A governance is a form of um, organizing that in order to move forward healthily. Healthily? Is that a word? Healthily. So, um, for me, what I've said, what I've uh, felt for me right now is we are going about it in practice. We are practicing sovereignty right now. Our stance on the mountain, we're totally all criminals right now. We are defying the current, the current powers that be. But we are also acknowledging that we have been out of practice for over 120 years when it comes to governance. So at this time, I think this is the healthy thing that's happening. We are re-exercising our right to be a people. But what we have fallen, but, and I think that the most powerful step here is that we're doing so in Kapu'aloha. The sacred mandate that is rooted in something far older and far more Hawaiian than a monarchy. Yeah? Far more older than that. Sacred conduct. Sacred mandate. Yeah? Kapu govern. Kapu are laws that govern between relationships of, that govern the actions of kanaka to each other and or to environment. Um, and we've just been out of practice of that for a long time. So I think right now we're engaging in the exercise of what that is to be sovereign as a people together. It starts with being sovereign as an individual. You cannot expect to have a sovereign nation if you can't even be sovereign in yourself. Um, and so we're moving toward bringing this back to life. So I know for myself right now, we are shifting the paradigms of power. Yeah? Not by raining, not uh, going in and trying to manhandle. We're, we're using and exercising law. We're exercising our own, our, our right, um, and exercising the, uh, what do you call it? Self-determination. Self-determination. Yeah? Um, we are exercising that right now. And we're doing so as a lahui, yeah. as a nation. Not as an individual little subgroup here, subgroup there, subgroup there. I know if you, if you get my card, you're part of this nation. If you get that license plate, you're part of that nation. No, as the spirit of a people. Yeah. Unify, uniform, like, uh, uniform together, unified, that's the word. Unified together in the mission of what? Higher than just give us back our documents, but let us save our life our lifeline, which is our aina, my kauka akinkai. So, I definitely feel that we're moving forward, but part of that reclaiming our independence and reclaiming our nation is that we should exercise something that shows our people trust, that gives our people hope, yeah, that this is a better option than what we have. Yeah. So, uh, some, some groups, uh, uh, I wouldn't want to follow it because of some of their policies. Yeah. But some of these are pretty solid. And some of these, of what we're doing right now, is that we're going to hold ourselves, all of ourselves, responsible for ourselves first. I do not believe in gaining sovereignty just so I can go drive whatever I like. I don't believe in sovereignty just so I have a right to go walk any place I like. I believe in sovereignty because I know we have a responsibility to take care of this aina and take care of each other in a formal way. So I think that's where we're exercising it. We have the mobilization of our people right now. And my first step right now on a uh, political note is and something that our queen told us to do, engage. You cannot sit to the sidelines and wait for super, Superman to come and fix the problems. We need to politically engage. So that's a, that's a big thing that we are taking hold of. And again, many of all of you are kupuna or makua. You have set the stage for our generation to step into that. You have sacrificed and give so much and give, pushed 
us to school to learn these things, to get educated, and still be grounded in who we are as a people so that we can be more effective stepping into these things. They don't know what's happening now. All of us um, charter school kids and emerging kids, their heads is spinning because, you know, we can walk all over Hawaii and do this stuff, at the same time, I can control all your laws. <laughs> so now, next step, I think, you know, for me, you know, my one little thing to this is we need to exercise engaging in political. Yeah. Again, right now what we're doing is, is a frontline action, but this is not gonna, the decision is not gonna be on the side of the road. The next step is that we engage, like that's why for me, we've helped to be a, a strong arm to help to protect those who have been in the, in the court systems, in that system. Ah, I'm not that great at it myself, but I know some other with big lips coming up who are great at it. So engage in the systems that are before us right now to be able to shift that and guide us back into our own sovereign practice. But we have to exercise and practice it first. So, Nikki Allah Thank you. Thank you. I, I like what Lamaki was saying. Um, I think self-determination uh, really means self-determination. We're exercising that now um, by challenging the status quo, challenging the establishment. I mean, I've done work at the United Nations and we, mostly we've been just going to the human rights complaining about what the United States is doing to the people of Hawaii. But when we go to the United Nations now, we will be reporting that we have been exercising our self-determination in the protection of our land and our people. What's happening up at the camp is that the people of Mokunui have established, really, a whole camp where you have free education, free medical, uh, established a whole system of how to feed the people. Everybody, sorry, everybody uh, is fed every day based on the goodwill. But when, when I look at the question of independence, that is that. And you know, we have much more power than we actually understand, you know. We challenge the occupation, yes. But we're also looking at what agreement did the United States make with whom? The people of Hawaii. I mean, that agreement, lots of people say, oh, I don't want to know about the Admissions Act. To me, it's an admission of guilt. Because <laughs> what it says is all the land in Hawaii shall be held in trust for the betterment of the condition of Native Hawaiians and the general public. That's their agreement with us. We didn't write that. The United States wrote that. The state alone was created just to oversee that. They're not the land owner, they're the overseer on behalf of who? Native Hawaiians, and let's go further. Who are those Native Hawaiians? Well, 50% blood or more because of the 1920 US relationship. But also, what about the 49 and less? Then, go further. Who are those people? Those are subjects of the kingdom. So, even the United States is admitting that. You, you understand, even though they don't really want to think they admit that, but that is what it is. So, when they are starting to do these certain things in law, they're breaking the compact between the United States and the people of Hawaii. The subjects of the kingdom are, are not only of the Koko, they were all ethnicities. You know, there was a time when Kamehameha School, the trustees wanted to talk to us and we said, what you like? It's like, we want to talk to you. So, I mean, you know, if the trustees want to talk to you, you want to sit down and go, okay, what? They said, I said, what, what you want? And they said, um, we want to talk to you because you guys are the you guys are the troublemakers. And we said, well we only make trouble the people who's 
messing with the people in the land, are you? <laughs> they said, well, you know, we got this problem. And we said, yeah, we got a problem. You know, and one of Uncle Paul said, yeah, the next time you guys cry wolf, don't let the wolf eat you. <laughs> Said, but basically it's simple. You folks are the largest landowner. We're the beneficiary. Our kids are the beneficiary. We would never want to hurt you. But we want to help you. You mustn't take U.S. money. Because the minute you take U.S. money, you're then subject to the race figures. You know, the question is, how come they didn't go after Punahou? Punahou has a condition in their laws too, which say you have to be a missionary stock to go there. They have a pre preference, right? But the question was this, if you just helped all of the people of Hawaii based upon this criteria, if you could prove that your ancestors were here during, at 1893, then you probably are a subject of the kingdom. You have to go with the kingdom law. Don't go with American law. American law, by definition, doesn't allow a last will and testament to be altered. So you stick with the kingdom law, but they don't, they're afraid of that. But maybe now they'll look at it. This is a time for us to bring these things forward to, to all of these big landowners because sovereignty is already here. We just need to invoke it and act on it. And it doesn't matter for me which crown someone will wear. What matters is a kingdom is nothing without its aina and its people and its fishes in the sea. It is the resources, those are the life. When they die, we die. We and the land are one. So when we rise up, we have to rise up in that way, and the rest is details. That even the United States told me one time that the United Nations, the State Department said this, Jello, you guys are all divided. And I was like, no, you are And he goes, yes, you are. I said, name the factions. And he named them. And I was like, oh. I'm like, oh, they've infiltrated more than I know. But I said, no, 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 no. We're all unified on the biggest question. And that question is, we have a right to self-determination as defined by international law, and that's all you need to know about. The rest of it is details, and that's internal. And we have a right to have this debate. We have a right to have different positions and to choose our best one. That's the definition of self-determination. But what the United States needs to know is we're in agreement on the big questions that matter for you, that you are occupying our country, and that we have a right under international law to decide our political, economic, and social, and cultural positions. So I hear you, Uncle, and I, and I hope that our debate continues and we get to this point where we can have those honest dialogues in Kapua Aloha. But we always have to stand for the Aina first, in my opinion. Um, and it's just my opinion, um, and it could be wrong, but that's where I'm, that's where I'm hoping to stand now. Because Mauna Kea is the great unifier, and it's the great magnifier of Aloha. Thank you. My name is Sarah Green, and thank you for uh, being here tonight and sharing with us. Thank you for allowing me to be here. Um, when I heard Kayla talking about uh, scientific imperialism and scientific colonialism, I started to think about what's happening on the Nadi right now with these football field sized drones flying in the stratosphere, beaming down harmful wireless radiation into the land, 
into the ocean, into the homes, into our bodies. And it's the same players, the OH is involved in this, along with Google and SoftBank of Japan, High Tech Corporation, um, also Aero Lerman from California, which is a defense contractor. And they already built a 16,000 square foot drone hangar on agricultural land on the Nighty prior to the Lenati Planning Commission meeting. Um, they already built an airstrip over there on agricultural land prior to the Lenati Planning Commission meeting. And when they were confronted about this at the meeting, they were absolutely unapologetic and defiant and said, oh well, we had to build that because SoftBank wanted to see physical structure, so we had to build it. Build first, ask questions later. It reminds me of what's going on on the Mana, and I just wonder if you saw any parallels there, and if there's anything you have to share about the Lenai drums. Thank you. Is that part of the, the 5G? <laughs> yes, uh, okay. the um, original application, which is the only application at this time, is about being harmful 5G. Um, there was some reaction to that, and then the applicants back in July 17th or so, they said that they were going to remove 5G. It's not, it's not there anymore, but they have not changed their application to reflect that. 5G is everywhere in the application, and even if they take it out, they still want to do 4G. It's still a problem, because if it's coming from the stratosphere, there's no place to hide. You know, if I don't want to be by a cell antenna, I can go to Hana or somewhere where there isn't. But if it's coming from above, there is no safe place, there's no place to hide. So it's still a problem, but yes, that is the project. I'm, I'm not totally familiar with it other than 5G. I, I'm, I'm not, I don't know all the details. But it would be good to know the details because I think um, this goes into my second part that I wanted to talk about is I know a lot of people give me heat about this position, but this is, I'm going to explain why. Um, there, there's a lot of people who um, we need to start taking political positions as well. And the way to do that is to remember that the, the monarchy was a constitutional monarchy. And what that meant is that people voted. Yeah, that's what a constitutional monarchy is. And I'm not, I'm not promoting voting for, to maintain the status quo. I'm saying we need to vote because the status quo is failing. And that is one way that we can make the changes now because I tell you what, when, when we hit the ledge, they kill us over that. And that's because a lot of our people who are coming from kingdom position, and I, I, I get it, I totally get it, but I just want to say there's nothing in international law that says that if you vote in an election in an American system, that you're somehow a turncoat, right? Because the definition of colonialism the de definition of occupation is you are occupied by a system that you don't agree with. So actually, by us voting and overturning these things like 5G and music, we are making the record for the international arena um, for uh, challenging the status quo. And we need to say it, go there and say it, and say, look at our people are voting and they're still 
you know, doing these things. But I believe that if we get enough people in these next rounds, we can actually make a transitional government. A transitional government going, the people we vote in say, hey, if you're for kingdom and you want to do a transitional government, you know, let us know because we want to make the changes because we can't live under the status quo anymore. We just can't. And we just have to refuse. But one way to refuse that is to use your voice and that one vote that you have to make that change. I'm just saying, you know, uh, I know there's lots of parties and all of that, but what I am saying is let's use our political power and our political will to make a difference now for, for the kingdom. Um, yeah, Kako, that, that's exactly, um, we have to engage. We have to engage. We need everybody to engage. We need everybody to just call work and say, I ain't coming to work, I'm not gonna make an excuse, I'm gonna go and vote. Yeah. Using the, the system that we're stuck under it anyway. Might as well use it to trip them up. Um, if not, we're gonna just continue to just be on our one game and then try and fight things when they flop on us. Right. Opposed to taking control. What I see in seminaries with happening on Malakia, actually, well, maybe a little different. Did you, there was there community meetings about this? About the, boom. Something that affects everybody and not, but not taking anyone's thoughts into consideration. That's also the class action suit. And if they don't acknowledge it, then a thousand votes go across the line and rip that thing down. What do you think we're doing wrong? At some point, we're at that stage, and that's kind of the, the, the peril that we really are, that we need everyone to wake up to. Right now, and I, I love seeing all these kinky here, but the scary thing for me is we cannot, none of us in here, can promise these kinky clean air in 20 years. None of us can, can promise them clean water in 20 years. <laughs> Why are we not scrapping out about that? We really for scrap our families for no for small little things, but we're not willing to go and fight for them for real issues. That for me is one of the big things that, that has that got me turned on to a couple of laws super fast. Of where am I actually gonna point my energy at? And all the time I was like, well, God, we're looking at me funny. Which means absolutely nothing. But yet how much energy I wasting on that. The Baba looking at me wrong funny is nothing compared to who is zapping me and my family and my children with radiation. Prioritize our battles. But we are at that stage because we've been status quo for how many generations? Now we are talking about the collapse of ecosystems for this planet to be able to sustain life. Yeah. What are our options? We don't have another 20 years to wait for it to adapt. Yeah. We're talking really everybody on it. 20 years ago. That's what this movement is also signifying. We are at the we're at the precipice. We're about to fall off. These issues just keep coming because the mega rich they don't give a rip. Hawaii, you understand what they look really look at Hawaii as? The most isolated landmass in the world. Great place to go test everything. We are the guinea pigs. Why are we the guinea pigs? We've let them do it. We did not stand up hard enough, unified enough as one. That's why Kapu Aloha is so important. It has a way of just, all the mina mina, don't worry about that. Stay focused. Yeah? Have a thing. There's a, there's a double meaning to Aole Makoa e mina mina. Don't be concerned with petty things. Stay focused on the big issues. Yeah. That's something I thought was really amazing about. I've seen some people who could never be in the same room together. 
up on that mountain. But Kapuao are reigning supreme up there, has demanded of them, of both parties, to lift themselves higher. It's not a muzzle. It's encouraging them to lift themselves higher out of the Mina Mina Maka and unify on a stronger goal. So we all need to engage. Kalamai, it, there is no point, there's no time to rest. I already had to start this when I was a young boy. My kids will probably have to continue. I think they say colonization of 100 years it takes four, four times the amount of time that it took to, to colonize a mine. It'll take four times that to reset it back into Portland. So we're seeing it. Here we are, a couple generations. Dolelo is back. It's growing. It's a perfect time. And the Olelo is breaking open all of this other form of thought. The Olelo is inspiring because of the chants, the Oli, the Puli, the prayer, the act, and that's what's activating us to be active again. Yeah, to be inspired again by stories and chants of great heroes of our ancestors. Yeah. So that we can become heroes in ourselves. So that we can feel ourselves greater than just being a regular mundane consumer. But that we actually aspire, you know, you need to think about our people. We can become gods. Because what is an akua? Something that sustains and supports life. Can we be a poor? Oh yes. We have to be. We don't have a choice. Okay. Yeah, put it high up there so we all reach 
for something better. And I, I would just tell all of the Poe Haole to not be afraid to reach higher because we need everyone to reach higher. And you know, I, I've heard some disturbing things uh, recently of people, you know, sort of saying, you know, don't come if you're not Kanaka, and that's ridiculous. You're not speaking for the movement, by the way, uh, because, you know, it's like the question of independence. Really, the question is not of independence, it's of dependence. How can we depend upon each other to make a better world? And, you know, my mom's haole is mom's haole. You know, it's not about color. But I do thank the poi haole for being respectful enough to be a little uncertain. Um, but just come from your heart. And sometimes you meet Kanakas who are healing from this colonization. But that's what this movement is about too. It's about forgiving ourselves, it's about forgiving each other, it's about healing from the pain and suffering that we have gone through, but we are now healing from. And the Mauna is the healer. So when we go to the Mauna, we are healing ourselves and each other and being patient and loving and compassionate with each other. Um, Tito, totally. And um, yeah, uh, fun little story. So actually, back in 2015, one of the biggest stands was that June 24th? Yeah, yeah, right. June, June 24th. 24th. That was the biggest stand. Um, I wasn't here. I was on a cultural exchange program. And I was, on the day that we knew that they were coming up and everything was actually, I was in Athens. And um, Lo and behold, well, I happened to be at the Temple of Delphi on that day. If you think about this temple, this is heavy to you. Remember in, in the movie 300, you know, the Dalek lady was chicken at it. That's the spot. Yeah, right, right, right. That's the oracle. That's when I had my whole epiphany of understanding the Mo'olelo of Poliahu and her needing to be pure because she was the oracle of Hawaii. So I was like, oh, I made this connection and everything. But I got back to, when we got back to Athens, it was like, I knew it was 8 o'clock, it was blowing up. I finally got Wi-Fi watching Facebook and we were seeing everything happening. And it was at the last line, I don't know if any of you remember from that video, the last line where the, where the Makani stopped and turned around. That last, last line, they were doing the hula pa'i umauma, that mauna kia, pa'i umauma. One day I was like, oh, like, oh my God, they're doing it. I haku that chant and put that choreography together back in 2006 for my kids in Monoka. Yeah. Um, and to see it now being a, a motion of defiance and to stand in protection was awesome. But then the camera would pan over, and at the end of the line was my 65-year-old Scottish mother from Colorado. I was freaked out. And I messaged my sister, Mighty, where are you staying? She's like, I'm home. I said, Walk down the mountain. My mom went up the night before <laughs> by herself, never told anybody. And she was on that line. Irish Scottish lady from Colorado who has a pacemaker herself already in her heart. Up there on that front line at, over, at about 10,000 foot elevation, she sent me pictures. Her chest and her legs are black and blue. She kept dancing. How many Kanaka would do that? The Aina no Sikala is his heart, is his spirit. The whole measurement of race or blood quantum is a genocidal practice that was brought to our people. It was not our people's practice. We cannot erase history, but we must learn from it and we must heal from it. This is what was saying. So at this time, again, for me, I'm also 
the thought that we gotta step back and look at the bigger picture. We're part, also talking about a world emergency right now. Everybody is, is crud uh, critical to this. And I'll tell you this, back in from 2015, if it was only a Hawaiians allowed, we would have been wiped out a long time ago. Because the masses that came were not all kind of come out And that is all great. It's all my kai. If you have a heart to stand for the aina, Ew. Ew. Mahalo. Mahalo. Yeah. And then we all, we all understand our place. Just as I would ask any Pohe Malihini coming over to be respectful, it's just the same as when, like, Yomoko, they come, they know protocol. They can't have it. You know, it's different over there. And even people from other parts of Moko Kehabe, they know when they come up there, it's the Mount of Peeps. Yeah? It's just the same protocol of coming in, like I would tell anybody. Don't come in and think you're going to just come in and tell everybody what to do. <laughs> we learned that from history, don't do that. Yeah? Um, but in that, we all stand for us. So coming from that heart space, from the Mauna, as we say the Mauna is the people of the whole planet. Therefore, everyone is a child of this Mauna. So if you, if you feel that kahia in the hour to come and stand for it, Mahalo, and stand for Hawaii, and stand for the whole world. So we need to bring the couple aloha down here and have everyone start training the trainers, start doing the thing with the goal of first and then the political questions about how, I mean, you know, my auntie used to say, to people who would say, I'm not political, I'm cultural. My aunties say, he was political the day he cried for milk. <laughs> you know, so we don't have to see politics as politics because we're reframing that paradigm to even know what is politics, what you talking about. Because in a way, it's just the way we want to live. Because we cannot live in this paradigm of uh, zero sums, you know, which is basically if there's a winner, there has to be a loser. 
The default of nature is cooperation. It's not competition. That's an anomaly. I mean, yeah, you can have some competition, like when you're playing a game. Just recently, I was just giving a talk, and I was, I was saying, you know, when we watch that that show Survivor, we was laughing. At least, you know, we were laughing like the guy really no can fish. Like, what's the what's the object of this game? And as it turns out, the object is to be the last man standing. We're like, oh, well, we need the big island version. Because if we did the big island version, it would mean everyone eats. That's the goal. What you gonna do if you're the last man standing besides be by yourself and lonely? You know, when you live on an island, you have to think differently. And so our goal would be everyone has to eat. So we start with those things. You put you put the the source in the middle. Mauna Kea is in the middle. What's good for Mauna Kea is good for the people. And then go out from there. So we shouldn't be afraid to dream and vision a good future that we want to see in the world. Be the change, as Gandhi said, that you want to see in the world. Gandhi and Martin Luther King gave us these tools to push back, you know, this nonviolent resistance, to push back on the Industrial Revolution. We're, in the, we're still suffering from the effects of the Industrial Revolution, but they gave us these amazing tools to remain really nonviolent. And so we need to keep the that practice alive. You know, Gandhi was in the 1800s when he, when he made those statements. You know, they're still relevant, but maybe more relevant now than ever before. So what I'm saying is, let's dream forward how we want the world around us to be, and we give up because we just gonna take this and boom, blow it up into unleash the peace. Hi, Kako. Puli kali mailalo. That's not just a mahi I turn. Quit waiting for handouts. Put your hands down and create your own future. That is where we are now. I would say from 2015, ain't no one just went home. That's why we made the second call. Remember, we were driving, we were getting ready for go up the mountain. Me and Koho Kai. Bro, I hope we get like 500 people. On our lowest day, we just barely get down to 500 people now. We never ever thought to see numbers like this. Never did we expect to see this. So, no one just went home. Everybody was ready. From 2015, look how much activation, look how much activation I saw in Maui. How much more Aloha'ina people went go run for offices? How many more people got active? Yeah. So we, I don't think anybody really just went home after that. Now we all got stuck in, we had to go pay bills in the house and that all goes on, but we are a little more different about how we approach it. Yeah? The boss not gonna yell at me like that again this time. Yeah? <laughs> but also, um, that's been a big thing that I would say, um, for the Mauna, there's, there's quite a bit of us who we've been talking about. Uh, what's, what do we see in our vision for the Mauna in the future? Because that's gonna end with TNT and then it's go home. We got 13 other issues up there. 14, you just call it the university itself. Yeah. But how we're going to get to them? And some people are like, how come we're not shutting them all down now? Kohokai has a great book. Um, Muhammad Ali is, is by far known as one of the, the best boxers in the world. But he never boxed all his opponents one time. Right? So we, how coy, you know? He's being shot on this one during the round. What we're seeing right now, and what I hope is happening, in this galvanizing of our people is we're, we're all practicing. We're in practice right now. Yeah? We're in good exercise. We've just reactivated uh, training on the Mauna. We go in, we're going into drills. And whoever you show up on the Mauna, so if you guys go to the Mauna, there's updates on the drills. You can hear that, that horn go, burr, burr. 
the rest of you, burr, 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 burr. you better be hauling your butt to that room. Put a tent cake and get it on the side of the room. We are getting activated. Now, what does that, act, that level of activation look like in our own communities? It starts with this. You walk in on the road, you see rubbish. You pick it up. That's where it starts. It starts with that. Because if you cannot do that, well, forget about the rest of it. If that is not second nature to you, to just see a bottle, whoa, pick that up, deal with that. You start curbing your ways of how you're approaching things. For me, first and foremost, this is an environmental movement, even a mama cultural movement. Because the environment that created our culture. Yeah. Yeah. So it's about the Aina. I approach this this environmental movement from my cultural perspective, from my cultural practice. But it's Aina first. So it starts with that basic. And right, I'm even blown away coming here and seeing how much you guys right here in this community and what you guys are doing. This is great. This is awesome. We can only go up from here. Yeah. So we're exercising, we're doing it, and I'm hoping we're helping to empower and to inspire more of this to happen. Because definitely the thing is, like right now from the Mauna, once we once the, the Mauna is safe. And once people are going home, they're already coming back to their communities and doing things, getting inspired. Okay? So we all need to start recognizing what is the parallel of Mauna Kea in your backyard. How do you galvanize? What have you learned from this movement that you can apply to that? I think the most important thing we've all learned from this movement is Kapu Aloha. Yeah, that's the one thing that's made it so different that actually catches worldwide attention right now. Yeah, but we gotta put all the mina mina away, learn how to speak to each other nicely. Because we're trying to converse, because we especially if you're on the same team fighting for the same thing, you cannot be killing each other. Yeah. We gotta work together. <laughs> that is the discipline. That I, when I call for two on the mana, for the mana of ku, it's not the primal, uncontrolled, unchecked rage. That's not ku. Ku is sharpness. Ku is discipline. Like we say, on the mountain, we have no security guards. Our security is our self-discipline. Why can't we do that in our own backyards? We can, and we will. So activation is alive. We're inspiring. You see how many kids walk around going, go high. It's starting. You see all the baby shots. Go okay, mama. It's activated. Yeah? So we have to nurse that around. Nurse it along.
contours in their in their quinoa forms or in their bodily shapes or, or figures of, of La Hawa and, and whatnot are, are starting to surface and reappear. And and um, when we say that we you know we're moving forward and we get into that progressive point and uh, refamiliarizing ourselves with our own body, our own uh, its environment, not its resources, but its environment, our own kind of resources, but it kind of sounds like it's something we want to get a hold of. But its environment and what, it, what its value is for, uh, for its environment, working its way down, tying that all into our religion and having that presented that way. Um, number one Hawaiian church, you know, like one hallelujah of, of, our, of our culture. In many churches right here in Mahina Town, for me, this is my church. Um, where or, or how, how do we approach that in our community to make it a, a regular, you know, to make it a, an everyday thing and be accepted, maybe not to be everyone's religion, but to be seen as, it's, as just as everyone else's religion is, where are you Mormon, Episcopal, Christian, whatever new form that you want to stand in under to acknowledge the, the overall existence. For me, one of the, that's one of the challenges, and I'm just curious to, to know. Listening to you guys, reaction to the question, a lot of our EK is parallel, so wondering how would you address that in your community, and, and are, or is there even in the scope for you in your communities? That's a good question. You know, is bringing that forward. Maunakea Anaina Ho, right? Anaina is often used as the congregation, but for us it just means the people, the new prayers of the Mauna. But you know, our Mauna are our temple. And why is it not that we can have Hale Pule up there? Here, Hale Akala, our Mauna, wherever you folks see fit from your community, where your sacred place is, is where we should meet and begin the prayer. Begin to recite and start to learn people in the community. We need, you know, the Kumul Yipo, creation is continuing. It's just we haven't been doing the chant anymore. I mean, myself and too, I mean, it's 2,000 lines at minimal. But what I'm saying is we should have, you know, a haku group that is continuing. All the species we find need new names, need to be a part of this new, our kumulipo, you know. Um, we need to look at it as an opportunity to bring uh, as we throw off the yoke of something that no longer works to be open and to receive ike to make new things start occurring to you know and um, I mean this idea that our creation is, is and that our, our path is only to extinction that's a bad model because we need to bully that. But the, to bully it means you do the practice. Go to the practice, go to the source, and go and re acknowledge that. Because extinction is um, the unraveling of creation. And so we have to go back to our practice. And here's why the first thing they took to colonize us was our connection to the Ahua. So the Mauna right now is helping to reactivate that connection for us. You know, we, we always look like we're protecting the Mauna, but really 
the mom that is protecting us and protecting us by being loving and compassionate to us to help us to give us those ike so that we can see exactly what you're seeing right here. That is a profound ike and mahalo for sharing that because that's what we're needing. When you said it, I was like, whoa, exactly. Why don't we do that? Mahalo. Kekino kekua, kaleho kekua, kamano kekua, epuku yaku. For our people, there are multitudes of gods, layers of gods. Because again, our concept of akua is what? The things that support life. And we understand that we all need the different spots in their, their roles. Even down to the political gods, the structure and order of community, right? Um, and new gods were birthed. We had more gods that, uh, in one Ohana, and uh, upon the passing of Allah, the only Hipili and born is a new Akua. For myself, <laughs> I found my peace with Christ by realizing I like that dude. His peeps on the other hand sometimes, you know. Not the bestest. But the moral that that man laid down in his life was my kai. There's some great things to learn from him. I'm going to use some of that. Yeah. And some of the things I've heard from my friends who are Buddhist, they shared some great one of all. I said, I can totally resonate with that. My kai. There's an archaeological site they found down in Kauai High a number of years ago. And it was, a, I think it was, a, they were saying it's a Halimua. So they were getting a Payakua, yeah, where they used to Hanaira Akua. Um, that he had still had still had like some of the uh, stone standings that some of the pukas were like the, the key were related to and you say all these times and then get the crucifix and the, the, the other ones too. When I heard about that that that's why I realized in the view of the people it wasn't one or the other. That's why I say, you know, if anybody like my family they like, oh, like my, my grandma, to the day was all, oh, they're very uh, staunch Christian. But with the earth shake, <laughs> there's still a respect. <laughs> it was always in us. I think it was like, it's kind of silly. You can have like the yes, you go at the same time. Oh, I don't kind of know. Because for us, it's all about, because again, in that, that level of an uh, akua, why do we have that? Why does almost every single culture in the world have some form of God worship, spiritual worship? Because what they are, when they look at the ki'i, yeah? ki'i again is to what? To capture. Yeah? The ki'i is like a walking heo. He is to ensnare yeah? the ao, the current, the energy. So the key is going is capturing all of this. Why is it, what do we need it for? To see the image, to know the story associated with it, to empower ourselves to be better. We connect with these deities in so many different cultures because they help to, to um, give us guidance and reflection and instruction or hope to be better for ourselves, for our community, for to honor our, our past and to lay down great for the future. So at the world today, we all mix. As much as we mix blood is we mix takua. We mix spiritual beliefs and practices. So for me, it's almost been, it hasn't been too much of a thing for me, because I'm just all like, I love everybody, so good. <laughs> now you will come in and try to tell anybody else that they're wrong, now we got issues. You be respectful what you love, you be respect what others have, my cut yeah. Some of us, we just bring them all to the party. I'm sure they're all sitting up there on the table and these guys fighting over who's going to sit next to each other. <laughs> No, I, I do a lot of this uh, a particular culture exchange program that um, our cultural center does is in Europe. Indigenous European 
right? You don't ever really think that, right? You say indigenous. European is not in our, in our spectrum. <laughs> I work in Poland. Well, what the hell is in Poland? <laughs> Poland people tell me that, why are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> Slavic. The work that I've been doing there over the past seven years has helped to spark a cultural renaissance for them to reconnect with their indigenous roots. Slavic people are deeply connected to the Aina. Yeah? They faced what we faced just longer ago. Catholicism came in there and really did a number on them. But they're finding all these little snippets, all these pieces, and they're bringing it back. It's Hawaiian culture being up there that's helping to give them a template and an example to resurrect and reconnect. So, um, something that I found in some of my travels and research Spiritual customs and religious practices are part of a unique grid system of the planet. And if you look throughout Oceania, Polynesia, from Melanesia, Micronesia, from Hawaii, Tahiti, Rapa Nui, Tonga, we're all very different, yet there's a very similar thread all the way through it, right? Look at the Americas. Yeah? They're very, very different. Even North America, South America, very different. Very, very different. But there's a similar thread through all of them. You see such unique similarities. Whether it be the headdresses of the Brazilians or the headdresses of the Plains people. There's always similarities. When I was in Greece and in Poland and Slavic, I realized when you look at the pantheon of their gods, from these different regions, from way up north, all the way down to Greece, there's such similarities. High God of in the north, Odin, lightning. Greece, Zeus, lightning. Slavic, Peru, lightning. And you look at the structure, very similar. We go to Asia, yeah. All very different, but a lot of similarities. So there's these particular grids. What is unique about all that is their ecosystems are similar. The land still is the influence. Yeah. We've run into some trouble here and there as humans. When we try to bring, or when, when in the past religious practices that were synced in with natural ecosystems and environmental shifts, when we try to take that out of its place, and put it in some place where it doesn't fit. Yeah? We, we experience a lot of that, yeah? Invasive species and things like that. How they just do a number on the ecosystem. Yeah? It's the same thing. Same thing. Yeah. So, I just always share with people when they come in that, you know, and as I have taught, and I've, as I was taught, so I travel a lot, uh, so my first time I remember going with my Pit River, Ohana, and the Hopi Nation, we were taught by Arkopura, they told us, you go over there, get different gods. You better respect their gods, you and their, you and their turf. So the first thing we do is, I need to meet your gods. Introduce me so I know how to be respectful. And in that sacred fires, can I invoke, may I call in my Akua from my home? They get it. They're like, shoot. Bring them in. Yeah. Aina to Aina, fire to fire, mountain to mountain. So for me, as I'm seeing this evolution, not just of our people here in Hawaii, but the evolution of the world, it's living, even getting to a, a higher consciousness of what religion and spirituality is supposed to do for us. It's supposed to help us be better people, to be better in our life. And so we can pull on all these archetypes we know the ones that help us fit and understand and live the best in Hawaii are the ones from Hawaii because they were created by Hawaii. Yeah. And so the best ones for us here. Does that mean that all, no one else is allowed? No. But if you really want to get to know Hawaii, get to know them. Because they are Hawaii. How are you going to know the stones of Mauna Kea? No polio. How are you going to know how to deal with the volcano erupt? Learn Pele. Yeah? Very different. So people are like, ah, it's 
freak out when the lava is erupt. Because they don't know Pele. Those of us who know Pele, when she blow up, she go, hi, Tutu. The lava coming down. Go clean the house, go make food. Because if Tutu come into this house, they're going to be nice. Yeah? You just relate. So for me, in that, I, it's almost because I'm so comfortable in just being in flow with everybody. And I really worry, unless someone starts trouble or tell anybody else that they're wrong. All right, they have any issues. But just having that open dialogue and respect that each will find the archetype that helps to guide them. Because truly, even amongst our own people, in, in, in Kabaka Hiko, yeah, when you go to other islands or to different moku, you step in and turn to for different gods. So we always have to learn how to kahea and show respect to those akua. So naturally, for me as a kanaka, it'd be rooted in that. It's like, you know, I get choking gods all over the place. <laughs> Because as I walk around the island, I go to many different ecosystems. I go into many different family histories. I go into different communities, all different layers of Akua. So for me, I tell everybody, just live Pono. Whatever Akua that you call on to help to guide you to be the best that you can be, Pono, for each other and for our Aina, to honor our history and to make the best futures for it. Mahalo. Just add them to the Payakua. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. 